All right, we are going to be reading uh, Daniel 3 this morning, but I'm, I'm going to kind of weave the scripture into the message kind of as we go. So instead of normally kind of reading through it one time first, we're going to kind of do it as we have our message this morning. So you can go ahead and turn there and kind of get that ready because we will be working through the entire chapter this morning. All right, Eloise is ready. We just made eye contact. We're ready. I'm excited. All right. Uh, let's, uh, I just want to begin by, uh, we're in a series this morning, I want to kind of recap quickly for you all, kind of last week. Last week we talked about how uh, so often there is a gap between our inspiration and our actions and behavior, right? We have a great idea, there's something we feel inspired to do, we're going to set out and do it, and then what happens? Somewhere along the way, it, there, it, it, it falls off. Our behavior doesn't match our actions. Uh, or, or often that's the case, too, with our discipleship to Jesus. There's a difference between believing and thinking what Jesus says and teaches is a great idea and inspiring, and then the struggle to actually follow and live that out well. And we ask the question, why is that? Why is there that gap between our inspiration and our actions? And the premise that I, that I presented last week and that I think the Bible teaches as well is that while certainly our rational minds kind of play a role in this, that, that we are actually largely influenced by our unconscious wants, desires, instincts, and values. What the Bible calls symbolically our hearts. Our hearts. One of the examples I used last week kind of thinking about this is, right, but you may remember the line, the, the run or the rhesus, right? Like you sit on the couch and you think, I need to go running. That's the idea in your head. And then kind of unconsciously, I'm giving you a little insight into my personal life, you reach over and grab that rhesus or two or three. I still haven't figured out how to eat only one. If you all have mastered that, you let me know. I'm not there yet. Uh, but so often, again, all this to say that when it comes to overcoming the gap between what we think we want and what we actually do, the question isn't what do you believe or think, but what do you want and what do you love? What do you want or what do you love? Because we, because so often, if, if that's true, then that we're largely governed by our hearts, by that, that deep well of our unconscious wants and desires and appetites and values, what we love, then the very next question we need to ask ourselves is this. Where then do our wants and desires and values come from? If that's what governs us, where do our wants and desires and values come from? How do they find their way into our hearts? Do we choose them? Are they, born, are they something we're born with? This is the question I was wrestling with this week. And I, to answer this question or to consider it, I want us to look at two kind of ideas or theories, okay? Uh, for the first theory that I present to you, I want to present to you uh, the famous author, Emily Dickinson, the filmmaker, Woody Allen, uh, and the singer and actress, Selena Gomez. Right, I'm sure we have a lot of big Selena Gomez fans in here. I don't know. I'm not. I just discovered this this week. But anyway, I want to think about those people. First of all, let's talk about Emily Dickinson. Right? Any, any poetry lovers in here? I, I like it. I don't read a lot, but I enjoy poetry. Uh, but Emily Dickinson wrote a letter to her friend and her neighbor, uh, Mary Bowles, in the year 1862. And in the beginning of this letter to her, she famously wrote, The heart wants what it wants, or else it does not care. Right? The heart wants what it wants. She was addressing the fact that Mrs. Bowles' husband was away, and she knew that, that Mary was missing him, that the heart was missing her husband. Okay, she wrote that back in 1862. Now, let's flash forward over a hundred years to now 1992, right? In 1992, it was discovered, uh, that's when it was discovered that the famous filmmaker Woody Allen had been having a romantic relationship with his girlfriend's adoptive daughter, <laughs> with his girlfriend's adoptive daughter, which was quite the scandal at the time. Uh, in a later interview with Time Magazine uh, about the affair that, uh, that took place, the interviewer was trying to understand what, 
Why were you having this affair? What caused you to have this affair with your girlfriend's daughter? And Woody Allen eventually said to the interviewer, borrowing once again from Emily Dickinson, he said, the heart wants what it wants. There's no logic to those things. You meet someone and you fall in love and that's that. Mm. Let's go ahead another 22 years to the, to the year 2014 when Selena Gomez released one of her hit songs titled, The Heart Wants What It Wants. In the song, she talks about this relationship that she's in and she sings, save your advice because I won't hear. You might be right, but I don't care. There's a million reasons why I should give you up, but the heart wants what it wants. Right? I, my friends might, she goes on to talk about, my friends might tell me it's a bad idea, but you know what? Who knows? The heart wants what it wants. Think about this. These are three examples in different generations pointing to the idea that the longings and desires of our hearts uh, are just this kind of innate, mysterious part of us that, as Woody Allen said, there is no logic or reason. Uh, and in fact, in his example specifically, he said, he, he basically demonstrated that these desires of our heart, we should just pursue them no matter what. Even if that means having an affair uh, with your girlfriend's daughter. Follow your desires no matter what, which is a mantra that our current culture seems to have adopted wholeheartedly. Pun intended, by the way, on that. They've adopted it wholeheartedly. That's on one side. On one side, we have the heart wants what it wants. But on the other side, I want to present to you the case of a man named Edward Bernay. I don't know if you've heard of Edward Bernay or not. Uh, this Edward Bernay was someone who worked for the government for a few years in and around World War I. Uh, but after the war, he became famously known by many as the father of public relations. Uh, in the 20th century for his highly successful work in advertising and in, po in political campaigns, among many other things. Uh, and he's kind of, kind of famous for his approach to advertising and public relations. Because before Bernay, much of advertising and public relations specifically was focused on the kind of practical nature of a product. And it was focused on getting the word out as far and as wide as possible. He, uh, the, the kind of prevailing thought was that if people know about how good a product is, they'll want to go buy it. If they just know how good it is, they will want to go buy it. But Bernay, uh, who also happened to be the nephew of some guy named Sigmund Freud, uh, he had a different approach to his strategy. Uh, he believed that the best approach was to understand what the consumer wanted and then to discover how to change public opinion to match the product that was being sold. So, for example, one of his most famous campaigns involved Lucky Strike cigarettes. Uh, uh, Lucky Strike cigarettes. Uh, American Tobacco hired Bernay to figure out how to boost their sales with women specifically. Uh, and so Bernay recognized, and this is back in the 20s, he recognized that in that time, in the late 20s, women were seeking more freedom, right? They just had the, the women's suffrage movement, and women were seeking out and wanting more freedom. And so Bernay organized a carefully scripted event that sought to connect this desire for freedom with women smoking in public. And so he recruited a large number of women to, to casually uh, smoke in public during the Easter parade in New York City. And he hired photographers to go out and to capture them in action. And he did this while they're standing in front of the St. Uh, Patrick's Cathedral there in New York, an iconic background. And then he, by the way, also called the New York Times and said, hey, I think you need to get down, to, uh, get down there. There's something going on. And when reporters went down to interview these women, uh, he ga they gave the carefully scripted uh, answer that Bernay had come up with. And so in the interview, uh, they, they called the cigarettes torches of freedom, that they were lighting the way to the day when women who, uh, could smoke on the street casually as men. All right? Do you see how he connected the product with what the people were kind of already 
had in their minds and in their hearts, and he used that to then sell them a product. And you can imagine, sales for cigarettes among women shot up because of this, uh, this thing that he did. Uh, there's numerous other examples. You can go online and read about them. He, uh, another famous example is how uh, women uh, said that uh, the Lucky Strike package uh, a green and red clashed with the fashion of the day. And so he actually went out throwing these uh, grand green balls and all of these things. He, he promoted all these things and eventually changed fashion so that green would be fashionable and go with the actual cigarettes being sold. It's really ingenious when you think about it. But here's, here's what he said in his 1928 work titled, uh, which is kind of funny, Propaganda, right? That was the name of his book. Uh, that, and he wrote this about his work. He said, The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. Listen to this. We are governed our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. He goes on later in the chapter to say, this is his opening chapter of his book, there is consequently a vast and continuous effort going on to capture our minds in the interest of some policy or commodity or idea. Does that not give you chills a little bit? When I read that, I got chills. This was in 1928, and I would argue that in 2022, this is going on even more than it was in 1928. So we have on one side Dickinson, Woody Allen, Selena Gomez, and others that, are, uh, that say the heart wants what it wants. But according to Bernay, perhaps it is more likely that our minds and our hearts are formed and manipulated by a host of of invisible forces around us that we may or may not have any insight into what those might be. If this sounds familiar to you, uh, it should. Uh, because as we read last week with Genesis 3, uh, the serpent caused Eve and Adam to sin, right? To want what God told them no to, not through force, not, to, not through saying you have to go eat this fruit or else, but rather through propaganda, using Bernays' words, seeking to influence their inner desires. Remember, verse 6 of chapter 3 of Genesis said, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, and then of course we know she goes on to, to take and eat it. It almost feels like, as I read that again this week, it almost feels like she had walked by this tree time after time after time and thought nothing of, oh, it's exactly what God said. I'm going to stay away from it. It's no big deal. But as soon as that serpent had worked that propaganda into her mind, she started to see the tree a little bit differently. Maybe as she wanted to see it. Or maybe, maybe more specifically, as the serpent influenced her to see it. And if I had to guess... I believe all of this was done without her consciously thinking about it. She didn't, she didn't get out her whiteboard and say, okay, God has said this, the serpent has said this, so you know, I'm going to go with what God says, or I'm going to go with what the serpent says. No, rather, her, her mind and her heart was captivated and manipulated by this propaganda fed to her soul. And because as people, our hearts and imaginations were designed by God to love, and to be captured and captivated ideally by God and the beauty and the glory of God and his vision for abundant life. Yet there are competing forces trying to sell us on what looks, uh, on what looks good by offering up propaganda or messages that form and shape our hearts in order to, for us to desire those things. So while we might say, that the heart wants what it wants, I think it is far more likely that the heart wants what it has been trained in, nurtured toward, and captivated by. 
Let me say that again. We might say that the heart wants what it wants, but I think it is far more likely that our hearts want what we have been trained in, nurtured toward, and captivated by. However, I don't know about y'all, but I, don't ha- I haven't had any sort of snakes trying to convince me to go buy any Granny Smiths recently, right? Like it doesn't, it's not, as, it's not something that we uh, overtly see out there in the world. Uh, so if this is true, if this premise is true, perhaps the way this process of desire formation, the way it happens looks a little bit different. And so for us to consider how this happens and what our response to it is, now I want us to turn to Daniel chapter 3. Uh, so if you all will do that with me, we are going to read the first, uh, first seven verses to start out of Daniel chapter 3, page 1374 if you're using your pew Bible. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come into the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples and nations and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn and the flute and the zither and the lyre and the harp and pipes and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace." Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn and the flute and the zither and the lyre and the harp and all kinds of music, all of the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Ooh, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of lists there, right? Um, as we read that, you know, as modern people... Uh, and modern followers of Jesus, it is really easy, I think, for us to read this story and to see it and to think, okay, golden statues, worshiping those things. Look, well, this is 2022. We're not, we not going to do any of that. We know that's just kind of a silly, old, kind of ancient way of thinking about things. But, but I want us to suspend that kind of thought for a moment and to first recognize that this is a story about worshiping something. And anytime, there's, anytime we talk about worship, we're also talking about the heart. Because we're talking about what we highly value and desire and are captivated by. We're talking about what we love. That's what worship's about. We, we, we love what we worship and we worship what we love. And so as we think about this story, let's just, let's just look at it a little bit closer here. Okay, first, let's notice that this statue that was set up as an object of worship and desire was done so by a powerful and influential authority, King Nebuchadnezzar, right? A powerful and influential authority. What we are captivated by is often influenced by those that we find captivating and influential and desirable in some sense. Okay, what, we, what, what captivates us is often influenced by those people that we find captivating, influential, and desirable in some sense. This is the whole industry of celebrity endorsement, right? If, uh, if someone's going to endorse it, we want to go buy it. If they are into it, maybe we should go be into it as well. Those that we idolize tend to have an easier time selling us on idols. It's just how it works. Uh, or, if, you know, have you ever watched a commercial... Uh, and been like, those are the most attractive, incredibly good-looking people that all seem to suffer from the need for a certain laxative, right? Like, isn't it amazing that all of these people have this, beautiful people have this same problem, right? There's a reason why uh, certain people are hired to sell certain products. In reading more about Brene, he was one of the first people who would use surveys or find doctors or whatever he could to speak as an authority figure on a product in order to sell the idea that it was important for people to have it. 
Now, he wouldn't go so far as outright lie about it, but he would use it to put enough of a spin on it so that people would find themselves thinking that they needed it. But I don't want us to just think about celebrity endorsement when it comes to people of influence. Uh, and I'll talk more about this in a couple of weeks when I talk about, uh, uh, about how we guard the hearts of our children. But think about it. Parents, grandparents, teachers, friends, pastors, anyone that we highly value in our hearts has an incredible amount of influence over us. How much of who we are and what we love and what we think is valuable comes from these relationships. I mean, think about parenting. Parents have an incredible responsibility when it comes to the lives of their children. It's one of the most important responsibilities ever because, because especially as a parent, you are in a position to influence and shape your child's heart more than anything else, at least for a, a long formative number of years. Right? I, I'm not a parent myself, but I've had the experience as a youth pastor of uh, having some of my students come back to me years later and say, do you remember when you said this thing? And I'll look at them and I'll say, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Whether it was good, bad, or something in between. And they say, oh no, I remember you said this here and it had a big impact on me, again, for better or worse sometimes. And we forget that children and, and teenagers have an enormous, the way, the way God has designed how we grow, their hearts and their minds just absorb that information. So whether it's implicitly or explicitly, our, our parents, our friends, uh, the people in our lives have a way of determining our hearts and what uh, we value so, so very much. Uh, I had a best friend in high school that was one of the main reasons why I, I think that I now love heavy metal music, right? Because he was someone that I looked up to that I thought was so awesome and when I discovered that music that he liked, boy, it spoke to my heart and it didn't help that he loved it too. And also, he was also a uh, really big time follower of Jesus. So praise God for combining those things, right? Uh, notice in our passage that it isn't just the king that's behind the statue, but he gathers the, the again, I'll go through the list again, because the author clearly wants us to know that it wasn't just him. The satraps, prefects, Governors, treasurers, justices, magistrates, and other officials. This is repeated twice in these verses. In other words, it is a collection of powerful, influential voices encouraging the people toward an end. Right, And all of us, if we think about our hearts to this point in time, all of us have had a similar collection of powerful, influential voices that have spoken to us and helped form us. Whether it's our parents, our friend groups, our spouses, celebrity endorsers, or the cultural storytellers that make up our culture. Authors, filmmakers, social media stars, all the people around us tell us stories that influence our values and our desires. We all are made up of this, this collection of voices. That's really, really important when we think about our desire formation. But also notice, again, next notice that the king doesn't just tell the people that they are to come worship this bland, small statue made out of gray limestone, right? That, that wouldn't do the trick. They'd be like, oh great, there's a rock, right? No, instead he erects this 90 foot high, golden wide statue. And he has behind it this orchestra playing this cinematic score so that every time you hear this beautiful music you're you're kind of uh, influenced to go and to worship this thing I, I know maybe I don't have a lot of office uh, watchers in uh, in our congregation but uh, there's an episode in the office where uh, one of the characters uh, influences he, he plays a noise every time uh, he wants another character to do something. And so over time, he plays this noise and the person expects to get something from it. And then eventually he, he plays the noise and the guy has his hand out to get something. And the, the other guy's looking at him like, what do you want? He's been trained over time from this noise. As I look at this right here, I see that we have this beautiful image and this beautiful music behind it. And I think about how we are sensory people that we've been designed by God to enjoy creation through our senses, that we find desirable things that appeal to our senses. And this is a good thing. 
Right? This is why uh, you don't walk into Opry Mills where the stores of Opry Mills and all of the colors are a various shade of beige, right? And you don't, uh, you don't walk into there and it's just silent. You don't hear anything other than your feet. And, and when you go to the food court, it isn't just one big giant salad bar, right? No, like they have all this set up so that you hear beautiful, the top hits being played on the radio. There's colors, there's sounds. You go to the food court and there's Panda Express. Praise the Lord, I say, right? Like there's all of these things there. It's playing into our senses. It's appealing to our hearts and how we were made. I'm convinced that you could hire the composer John Williams to write a score for your life and you could play it while you go to the grocery store or go to the dentist and it might even make those things fun, right? Like it's, we are people that are drawn toward beautiful things. And again, I'm not saying that having bright colors in stores is bad. I'm saying that what appeals to our senses has, a, has an effect on influencing our desires. It's why you think about the old, uh, a lot of the Renaissance artists and who made all this beautiful Christian art. It's why you think of the Sistine Chapel and you think of that beautiful scene above you. It's, it's trying to appeal to a different side of us. So we have the influencers. We have the appeal to our senses. And then finally, we're invited to only see one side. Now notice again in our passage, the people are invited to see only one side of worship here. How was this golden statue built? Well, we're not told that. Where, where did the king get the resources to build the statue? Who built it? We aren't told that in these passages at all. And I think that the king doesn't want the people to ask any of these questions. Uh, because we know the history of the Babylonian Empire, right? It was an empire that was built on violence. It was a nation who had conquered a number of other nations, including Israel. Uh, that's why Daniel and his friends were there uh, in Babylon, because they had been captured. And when Israel was robbed of its wealth, uh, they went into the temple and took out the gold and the silver and all of these things from that nation. Could some of that gold be now what this, this giant statue was made from? I think it's probably likely. Uh, but the king doesn't want us to ask any of those questions. They just want you to bow down and worship it. Consider in a similar way American consumerism and our, our usage of our resources. We're encouraged to buy and to spend and acquire more and more. But you know what we rarely ever see? We rarely, we rarely ever see how the product was made, who made it. And we certainly do, we don't often go see where it ends up when we're done with it, right? Unless you happen to go drive by Briley Parkway and see the giant hill that's created there on the west side of town or outside of Murfreesboro. When you go through, Walter, I think it's Walter Hill, and you smell that wonderful smell that you, you know you're at a place where you see the, the effects of our overusage of our resources. And this, I think, again, is by design, especially, I mean, Apple phone chargers, right? Like we could have a whole thing about Apple phone chargers, how terrible they are and how we need more and more of them. Uh, but again, to recap, to go all the way back here, I think our hearts and the, the source of our desires, wants, and values are more formed unconsciously by the cultural forces around us in our families and in our communities and in our greater, and in our greater culture than are consciously chosen. I don't think that the heart wants what it wants. Again, I think the heart wants what it has been trained in, nurtured toward. And I think this is done through an influence of powerful and influential figures in our lives, from our parents to celebrities to teachers to our friends and to our co closest confidants. I think it's done through appealing to our senses, our sense of beauty and storytelling. And I think it happens through presenting us a picture of success and power and grandeur that shows us glory, but not the cost. But the good news for those of us that are hearing Bernay and thinking about all these forces out there, the good news is that if our desires and our wants and values are formed and learned to be used by the kingdoms of the earth, then they can also be formed and learned and lived out through the kingdom of God as well. And so, let's continue with Daniel 3 here as we get near the end. Verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said, the king, they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. 
You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the images, the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image that I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Pause here once again for a moment. Just as a reminder, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Jews that were forced to live as exiles in a foreign land. Their kingdom was somewhere else, and they were living in a land with a much bigger kingdom around it. And they served, and they lived well and effectively in this kingdom. They didn't go try to overthrow the government. They didn't try to get back to Israel. They weren't out to cause a lot of problems. That is, until they were faced with something that went against the core beliefs and values that had been instilled in them by the time they were boys. Remember the Israelites prayed the Shema prayer every day that comes from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And after year after year, day after day, month after month, after praying this prayer, when they saw this image that was before them, they said, "Mm -mm, not for us. We belong to a different kingdom. We belong to a different God who plays by a different set of rules, who has different values, and we're not going to compromise to this God. Consider how they remained faithful to God despite knowing the consequences uh, of a brutal death. How does that happen? You don't just wake up one day and, you know, stand in front of the king of an empire and say, no, you know what, God, you know what, king, I hear what you say, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, The furnace for me, you don't just wake up and, and one day do that. This is a process of formation that happens day after day, year after year. Their desires, their wants, their love was on the Lord God and his teaching without compromise. And see, the the question for us isn't if your hearts are being shaped or formed. That's not the question. It's not if your hearts are being shaped or formed. The question is who or what is shaping your hearts? Who or what is shaping your hearts? What are you being formed into? Are you becoming a person that is being shaped into worshiping and loving the desires and values of the world or of the kingdom of God? Because we are all being discipled by some sort of propaganda, some sort of idea for the good life, some sort of definition of what success looks like, some sort of vision of what we have to have in order to be happy. The church father Augustine said this about the orientation and power of our heart's desires. He said, my weight is my love. Wherever I am carried, my love is carrying me. Quoting this, the author James K.A. Smith writes, Our orienting loves are like a kind of gravity, carrying us in the direction to which they are weighted. If our loves are absorbed with material things, then our love is a weight that drags us downward to inferior things. But when our loves are animated by the renewing fire of the Spirit, then our weight tends upward. 
And for these three Israelite men, the fires of the furnace of Nebuchadnezzar weighed less in their hearts than the fire of the Holy Spirit, convicting them that God alone was to be their primary love, even if that meant death. Aren't you still astonished by that the, the reply in verse 17? Right? If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the, pow- from the, from the furnace of the blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. Full confidence in the power of God. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. In other words, we have complete openness and loyalty to God's plan, even if that means we're not going to be saved here. We'll choose death over serving you. That's the kind of faith that I want to have. That's the kind of conviction that I want to have. When it goes back to that question of Jesus, what do you want? That's what I want. That's what I want for our church. That's what I want for the people of God. Right? (laughs) Let's finish up here. Verses 19 through 30. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than the usual, than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes and trousers and turbans and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the burning furnace, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor a hair of their heads were singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him, and defied the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces, and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Ooh, man, don't you want to be like them? Don't you want to have a faith and a conviction that even as we live in exiles in Babylon here in our day, in our time, that there is a God who is present with us in the fire, who is with us and will not leave us or forsake us, who has the ability to make us into people that can withstand all of those forces that Brene talked about, seeking to tear at and influence our hearts for evil, and that God can sanctify us for good. That's the kind of God that the Word testifies to. That's the kind of God that I believe that we have. And for the purpose of this message, I simply want to say that if our hearts and our desires and values and wants are all shaped by something, if they're all shaped by something, if we're all trained and discipled to live and to believe and behave in certain ways, then I want my heart to be shaped and discipled by the King in the fire with us. 
I want my heart's desire to be captivated not by any vision of success or, or the values of the world, but be, to be captivated by the story and the person of Jesus who isn't out to profit off us, but who, who in fact paid the cost for us. For us. We have a God and a King whose vision of life and love looks like self-sacrificial love for us who looks like whatever influence that our hearts have been, have been influenced by and captured by, He is the one uh, who has the power to set those free to live for Him. Whatever propaganda we might believe about ourselves, whatever lies that we might have about us, He is the one that can set us free. And His call to life isn't necessarily glamorous, or sexy, or popular, or desirable. It wouldn't fit well in a mall anywhere, or anything like that, because his call uh, to life, he, as he told his disciples, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, you must take up your cross, and you then must follow me. You must crucify your desires, crucify what you want, what the world wants, and be resurrected to the desires and vision of what God wants for you. And my friends, as we do that, may we remember that this is what Jesus has done for us. That what the world may call propaganda is actually that the saving death of Jesus meets us in all the places of our hearts that have been captured and formed by sinful desires. And it's through his love and grace that he has the power to resurrect us and remake us and remold us into people whose love isn't animated by the things of the world, but it's anim animated by the Spirit of God. That we can become people who live by the Spirit, who let, the self, who let our hearts become defined by self-control and gentleness and humility and service and all of the ways of the kingdom. And so may we hold fast to Jesus. May we hold fast to his way and to his kingdom. May we not live as compromised people, but rather as people committed to Christ. And may the Holy Spirit be who forms and shapes our hearts as we seek him. Next week, we're going to talk about what that looks like. What is the process by which we can become people of virtue, not people necessarily of vice, not people of compromise? And I'm excited for us to do that but remember that this week that we're always being formed one way or other either into the image of the kingdoms of the world or into the image of Christ may we here at Brush Hill be people formed after Christ let's pray